Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round digital talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television and theater. And today we're really fortunate to be joined by Manny Koto, who's the executive producer on Fox's new series, Next. And I wanted to start by diving into when you were first coming up with the concept and when you're first taking that pilot out to pitch, because I think there's always a lot of different information that people hear about what you need to put together as a creator, as a showrunner, beyond just the script of the pilot. And I was really interested in what the supplemental materials that you find to be the go-to items for to create beyond that pilot script are, and what maybe some of the things are that you like to create that you don't necessarily have to, but you find to be really useful tools at that point in the process? Well, you know, in the case of Next, where, you, where you're creating, um, you know, not just a series of characters and a situation, but you're kind of creating a world where you're, you're creating, you're, you're in science fiction, you know, or, or science thrillers or whatever you want to call them, you're, you're creating a, a whole extra science, you know, fantasy fiction level. And so that has to be worked out and, and worked out in as much detail as possible. Now, next, next, you know, hewed pretty close to reality as, as, as far as we could, um, but it still required, you know, a kind of a, a, a world breakdown, kind of figuring out what the world is going to be, what are the rules in this world, what, 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 what is possible and what is not possible. And um, so that is something that I had to figure out in this. You know, in, in, in next case, it was, uh, it was an interesting scenario. I didn't really pitch it. Um, I, I kind of wrote it on spec uh, and... Uh, uh, sent it out as a spec script. And, you know, in my case, it, it, as far as selling something, I think it helped with, uh, you know, I had had a, a, a reputation. I had already worked in the industry for some time. And uh, I had worked on a show that was not dissimilar, at least in, in tone to this 24. So it made whoever was reading the script, you know, it made it a little bit easier for me. You know, uh, had I been going out as a more of a novice, I would have I still would advocate writing on spec. I think it's the best way to produce something. I did it on features, you know, very early in my career, I was one of the very first people to sell, you know, there was a period in the nineties where there was a spec script sale wave where scripts were going for, you know, tons of money. And I was one of those along with Brian Helgelin, who's another screenwriter. We, we were partners and we wrote the spec trips and we sold one for a lot of money and kind of jump started both our careers. And, I've never kind of gotten away from that in a way. I mean, I've always felt that that you should, if you can, you're better off writing it on spec so that it exists, it's yours. And then, you know, if you send it out and they don't buy it, it still exists. And you can always send it out some other time. It'll, it, it, it's still alive. Whereas if you pitch it and develop it, then if it dies, it's dead. I mean, it, it usually, I've done that as well. And, you know, story, you know, see, there there are still TV shows that I've pitched that I wrote a pilot on that uh, I kind of wish I could have back that, but that for some reason, you know, when your pilot's dead, it's dead. Movies die, movies can die and, and live on, you know, in other, other ways they can be sold or put in turnaround. But for some reason in the TV industry, at least when it used to be, if your pilot died, you forget it. And so um, uh, I advocate, you know, writing on spec and, and, and that's what I did in this case. And in this case, I didn't really need, you know, just beyond the script and, you know, when, when, when people were interested in the script, they did want to know, okay, well, what's the series? Because, you know, the, the script, is a little, it's a little, you know, it, it's serialized. And so you're, you're kind of the question, next question comes to mind is, all right, well, how does this go beyond one episode, but, but, but multiple seasons? And so at one point I had to sit down and really plot out an entire season and write it out. I wrote like a 30 page, 35 page document uh, on what the whole season looked like from one to 10. And it's funny, you know, when we ultimately did produce the season, we ended up following it pretty closely. Uh, it was pretty, pretty surprising. So, um, I mean, I hope that answers you. I mean, I think, I think, you know, it, it, as much preparation as possible, uh, but it depends on how you're going out. I, you know, if I were going out with something, you know, like this again, I would actually, I would try, I, I would try to get some illustrations made, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially when you're dealing with something that's not just a, uh, you're a, a regular drama when you're dealing with something that, you know, that, uh, that you're, uh, that, that inquire, that requires imagination. It's, it's, it's always a good, if you have the money and you can, or have friends and contact, you can get somebody to do an illustration for you. It helps. 
Yeah, no, that's a really great and informative answer. And, you know, you were mentioning the technology in the show, which is obviously such a central theme and core to every aspect of it. And it's so interesting that, you know, a lot of AI storytelling is, oh, if we create robots, robots are going to take over. And this really isn't. It's really about programming um, and yes. coding and what we can already create. And you're really keeping it in this world that is real and feels like it could happen this week. It could happen next month, next year. Um, which really kind of is a great way to center that audience sphere. And I was interested in, in how you kind of mapped that out, why that was so specifically important to you and kind of what that research process looked like in looking at the technology that exists, but also where could it potentially go in the near future that it still feels very present day. Right. Well, in a way, the research kind of came first on this. I, I, um, I uh, you know, I, there have been a lot of tremendous AI Te uh, centered movies and series, most of them dealing with robots. Um, and so I really never really planned on doing anything like this, but you know, it, it actually happened by accident. My, I had a lot of Alexas in the house and my son one day woke up very tired and I said, what's the matter? And he said, Alexa started talking to me in the middle of the night. And that got my mind rolling. And I said, well, wow, that's great. And it sounds like a, like a classic ghost story where you're, the, you know, the, 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 the parent is walking down the hall, here's the kid talking to somebody, opens the door and says, who are you talking to? The kid's alone and the kid's, oh, the, the, the little old lady who comes to visit me every night. It felt like that. And on top of that, I started seeing articles about, uh, you know, a lot of them, you know, from Elon Musk, you know, being interviewed and Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking at the time sounding alarm bells about the possibility of an of a super intelligent ai accidentally arising so i started researching that because that sounded fascinating to me i had not it was the first time i'd really read articles or seen real you know intelligent people saying this is a real very real danger and so in doing excuse me the research i saw that it's not in, completely impossible that something like this could arise very soon there was a i think a, a, a survey done among computer scientists about when we could possibly, excuse me again, I've had too much coffee this morning, develop as AI or super AI. And most of them said 100 years, 50 years, but there was a, a decent percentage that said, you know, 10 years. And that was five years ago. So I said, all right, so it's plausible. And so I really sat down to think, how would it look like today? You know, we don't have Androids. We don't, you know, you know, to me, I always thought, I always think Androids and AI are interesting because to me, the Android itself is almost as a fantastic creation as the AI itself. It's like you can't really separate them because to create uh, something that can move and look human is almost as miraculous as the AI. So it's like two different concepts in, in my view. So I wanted to do something that was dealing with programming. And then the challenge is how do you, how does it manifest? What does it do? What does it want? Uh, and, and I arrived at two things that a lot of this was through the research, honestly. A was that this whole concept of an AI machine achieving consciousness or or, or becoming self-aware is basically meaningless. It doesn't really even have to happen. It's not the scary part. The scary part is, is if you would develop a piece of software that is programmed to uh, replicate itself and improve itself. We already, you know, there's already companies that are creating AI by creating AI. And if you create an AI, there's a theory that, that you can create an intelligence explosion, whereas an AI rewrites its code and becomes better and better and smarter and smarter. But every time it rewrites its code, that improved version is that much better at rewriting its code. So you get an exp exponential explosion where you have, you, and you could possibly end up with an AI that is super intelligent. And then the question becomes, now what? And all you need is really an AI that has a goal that is misaligned with ours. I mean, the, the outrageous example is the paperclip scenario, which has been posited, whereas you, you have a machine uh, factory that has been run by a computer that's designed to make paperclips, but the computer accidentally becomes super intelligent and we can't shut it down. So it ends up turning the entire universe into paperclips. It, it's just it, because it's simply following its program. And in the series, we have a similar situation. I'm, we're not dealing with an AI that has achieved consciousness or knows who it is or is asking any eternal questions. It simply wants to get smarter. It's been programmed to do that. That's how it was programmed to get the way it is. And But in doing that, it, it, it implies a lot of other different issues, meaning it doesn't want anyone to turn it off. That would not be part of its programming. It doesn't want uh, anyone to rewrite it because it's now smarter than anyone else. So it can rewrite its own. So it doesn't need anyone to rewrite it. And this AI also assumes that humanity, knowing humans as, as it does, because it's so smart, will be afraid of it and want to turn it off. Well, it sets in, uh, it sets in, in, in motion certain things, uh, uh, moves it does 
to stop anyone who, will, who finds out it exists. So it becomes a thriller about something that wants to protect its, its secrecy. A lot of these, the theorists said, you know, one of the first things that AI would do if it actually arrived soon would probably play dumb because it would know, it would be smart enough to know that we'd be terrified and we would probably try to shut it down. So that's what this AI does. And, and in doing so, anyone who finds out it exists becomes a target. And a target in such a way that it's, it's not sending robots or nuclear weapons, it is attacking them in the way that something like this, like a very smart hacker might, meaning using information about these individuals against them, destroying their lives, uh, sometimes creating lies and fantasies and you know, working, working information to cause people to do things that uh, destroy them in such a way so that they become, that, that you, you neutralize the enemy. So, um, so that's really kind of how, how it came to be. I, and, I, and I felt that that is at least something I had not seen before, at least not in so much this state. Uh, you know, I had seen, we had seen the robots and we had seen, you know, super intelligent AI in the future, AI is controlling spaceships and whatnot, all great stuff. Uh, but I felt that there was a, an opportunity to do something here that's more grounded and really ask the question, what would it really look like if it actually happened? Mm -hmm. And because you were mentioning the experience that kind of was the original genesis for you with your son waking up and hearing the Alexa, I was really interested in the character Eliza within the show, who's an Alexa type device and, and how that personal experience influenced the relationship that you create on screen between Eliza and the character Ethan, who's played by Evan Witten, uh, who's the son of a couple. And it's, it's so fascinating because it's not just something where you have her answering questions strategically, you know, there's an emotional manipulation of this child that begins from this Alexa style device, Eliza. And so it's really fascinated how you kind of almost mapped her out as a character within there and within scenes. Yeah, well, it was, it was, you know, the Eliza is really what we ultimately find that, you know, we, we, we know pretty soon it's next. And, and, and the computer is basically using Eliza as a voice to kind of influence the kid, because it's, it's really, it's not so much attacking the kid, it's attacking the mom by dis by disrupting this kid's life and by just in turn disrupting her life you know it, uh, alexa i always i looked at this character the character of eliza and next very much in, in the way uh, like a demon would operate in a classic kind of oh the exorcist if you remember the exorcist and especially in the book by the way the the demon goes after people by using its knowledge of these individuals and and really you know and using it against them uh, it destroys, uh, you know, all the a lot of the characters in, in, in the book that way. Uh, and that's very much how this operates. And so Eliza became another voice kind of of next using uh, this relationship with this kid who was already having trouble at school, who was, you know, shy and who's one of these kids who's shy and who's, you know, who's being picked on. And so it uses that uh, as, a, as a crowbar to get into his life and, and kind of convince him to do something or almost convince him or, or get him to the point to do something kind of unthinkable, which is, you know, protect himself in a way that would, would kind of destroy everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, you know, there's such an interesting thing in terms of the way that Eliza is using people's personal information against themselves. And you kind of crafted this great narrative device where all of the characters have something that they're hiding that people around them don't know about that's taken advantage of at a certain point within the plot. And I was really fascinated by that and the way that that you know, kind of forced you to create these really layered characters with elements of backstory that maybe wouldn't have been developed within the script and on the screen otherwise if it weren't for that plot point. That's exactly right. No, that's exactly right. I, I you know, it was, it was because I knew that, you know, the pilot was basically setting, you know, these characters, a group of characters with kind of built in landmines that we know are going to, you know, kind of explode down the season. And so because uh, uh, you know, I was, I was going, creating a, a character that was, again, digging into these people's past and, and using it against them. You had, to, everybody had to have a secret. Like what you just said was really, you know, it's, it really forced me to sit down and create people with interesting and, you know, and dangerous pasts. Some, you know, uh, some of them are, are, you're asking the question whether these people are, are actually good or not. And others, so have something in like our, our you know, uh, like Shay Salazar has something in her past, which she had thought she had buried and gotten away from forever. Uh, I mean, th I think there's very few of us who don't have something in our past that we wish would not come forward or something in our past that with a little manipulation could turn into a liability. 
And so uh, what you said was perfect. It really, it really forced me to sit down and say, all right, who are these people? Because every one of them I'm, is going to have something that's going to come forth. Yeah. And the character development within this in the show is also really interesting in the way that it's mapped out because the whole season really takes place in the span of about a couple of weeks, which isn't very much time in the real world. But through the experiences that they're going through, there's much more character development than you usually would see in the average person in two weeks. We don't necessarily change that much in two weeks, but these characters do. And so it's really interested in how you match that out to make these very fast changes, but also to ensure that you're constantly stepping back and making sure that every shift and change in these characters feels very believable as well at the same time. Well, I mean, it, it really, I mean, as far as mapping it out, it really was no different than literally mapping it out, literally, you know, taking these characters and find and kind of first deciding what each one is going to undergo, go through and kind of put plotting it on a board and then and seeing where they could interweave, the stories could interweave together and where the, some of the stories could complement each other and some could clash. Um, you know, I could discuss, if I were to discuss the ending, it would give away too much, but there's a, a, you know, a story at the beginning that really kind of comes full circle and actually plays a part in, in how we're gonna end up fighting next. So um, it really is a, a matter of, 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 first of all, deciding what these stories are, what, what these characters are gonna go through and and then and kind of interweaving them and seeing how they weave throughout the, the 10 episodes. Um, it seems like a lot of what, what's really happening is are these are, are these characters are being challenged in a very dramatic way. And so they're, you know, it, it, it also it leads things that probably wouldn't have come up in their lives ever or, or not for a while are all being, you know, shoved into their faces immediately. And so it's like a pressure cooker. It, it is, it feel, it is a lot of stuff in two weeks, but it's because of next really kind of, you know, <laughs> creating this, 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 this really, you know, toxic stew, putting everything in a pot and really turning up the heat. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting because it was, it was an, it was, a, it enabled us to, to keep, you know, the pace really kind of tense and, and scary, but also really character centered. Uh, really, really make it about what these people are going through. Um, and so, you know, it was, the construction really kind of helped design the season. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned the pacing just there, and I actually wanted to ask you about the overall pacing and the rhythm and, and how that's kind of figured out and structured out. Because, you know, like any television show, you've got kind of, here's your larger plot arc, and here's all of the subplots that you're mapping out throughout. But particularly with, with a show like this, you're creating a heightened sense of suspense at the end of every single episode. You're also having to build in, you know, for television advertisement breaks where you need to kind of have a little bit of a crux that's still going to keep drawing an audience back in. So you're almost drawing the audience back into the story further multiple times in every single episode. Um, and I just thought that you did it in such a beautifully constructed way and was really interested in what your process is for figuring out and making sure that you are hitting all of those correct beats along the way. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, you know, when, 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 I, when we, I figure out a story, especially a story like this, I really kind of try to whatever the story, how it generates is really trying to kind of hopefully come up with a story that that has built in uh beats you know that are built into the thing so that you you know you you could almost like a lot of these stories have multiple points where you could you know cut to commercial because there's a lot going on and there's multiple stories so uh and because it's such a pressure cooker situation it it you know almost every one of these stories kind of leaves a multiple you know uh multiple places to kind of end an act this is one of the first series i've worked on where I had real, very little trouble coming up with act breaks. Usually on a lot of series, you're like, what's the act break? Oh God, we gotta, we gotta come up with an act break. In this day, we're just, we could just sho shovel them around because there were so many of them. And I think it just the situation. I mean, you know, the other thing was, is that, you know, it's part of this built into the series is that the series becomes very quickly also a manhunt because the computer, this is, you know, an AI like this is not something that can just kind of break out and get into the internet and copy itself. This is a very complex program that needs a certain specific computer architecture. So it literally is on the run physically as well as, you know, and while we're chasing and trying to find out where it went before it gets to a certain area where we won't be able to stop it, it is attacking us. So the, you know, the, the, the structure um, was a two-way structure. It wasn't just attacking us. It was it was it was fleeing from us at the same time. So it became kind of a, you know two things happening, which really informed the pace of this. We have to try to find this thing before it gets here, or uh, survive long enough before it kills us. 
Yeah. I was also curious if the sound design and the music design was more of an integral part for this project than perhaps some of your previous projects, because again, it just really adds to that overall tone and the suspense that you managed to bring forth. And you can tell that there's a lot of very kind of specific decision making going on behind the scenes and all of the noises that you're hearing throughout. Oh yeah. You know, very much so. I mean, well, the first step, I mean, the first thing I did was, you know, hire Sean Callery, who, who's, you know, my favorite composer who did 24 for us and who's just one of the great television composers and who just knows how to, you know, not just maintain pace, but to, to really kind of, you know, dig out those moments and the emotions that you're trying to build. So as far as sound goes, the step one is, is making sure calorie comes in and, you know, John, uh, Sean is, 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 is somebody who I just, you know, you, you kind of hand over an episode and you, you don't really have that much spotting. He just kind of takes it and he instinctively knows what to do. Uh, but sound design was also a very specific, you know, we had, you know, a lot of it was really what the things that we weren't going to have. And, and what I mean is that we wanted this to kind of hew closer to the reality so that, for instance, when people open windows and computers in most movies, you hear beep, 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 and these cute little sounds that don't happen in real life. And so we wanted to keep, you know, a, a lot of it was like what we left out, which is all the, the, the cute computery sounds, which, which, which uh, I think, you know, immediately make the audience kind of go phony. Uh, and so we kept, you know, we, we kept it to a strict kind of what it would really sound like uh, uh, basis. And, um, and, you know, they don't make much noise. My computers don't make a lot of noise. And so you're really hearing fans and you're hearing just kind of the, the, the whir of it. And, and it was also interesting was like next had a very kind of, you know, it, it really would appear in, in different voices, you know, it would appear as Eliza, it would appear as next. Sometimes it appears as a, uh, you know, as a, uh, a navigation software, but we were strangely the way it works is that you, we always understand that it's next and it kind of worked out well. So um, next had its own kind of interesting sound design where it was, it was just one personality with multiple, multiple uh, manifestations. Yeah. And how did kind of the central use of technology within the show feed into a lot of the visual choices that you make? You know, there's a lot of moments where when it's centered more on an intimate character moment where the camera's a little bit slower, there's obviously the faster cuts, but also there's an overall aesthetic and, and visual tone to the entire piece and, and very clear color palette within it as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it really did kind of depended on where we were. I mean, I, I, uh, I was trying very hard to kind of not have this, this series unfold in, in mostly in technological spaces you know i wanted it to be in people's homes and in places places we understand in people's cars and you know garages and and the world around us so that it's not all just kind of this rarefied tech industry place but the you know the the computer areas kind of have their you know their kind of soulless mechanical uh kind of uh drone and 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 lighting and color 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 palette which is uh, which was a, a conscious, you know, partially is our, our wonderful DP and 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 our directors kind of all kind of hewed to this to this very kind of strict, uh, you know, keeping the 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 the, the non computer technical areas, you know, more warm and 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 accessible, and the other places more cold and 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 technical. And I think the palette kind of works throughout. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask you a little bit about working with the cast on the show and, and kind of how you and the rest of the crew created the environment that was conducive for them because obviously, you know, someone like John Slattery in terms of having conversations about character development he, with him is going to look very different to Evan Witten, who's the really wonderful young actor playing Ethan in the show. And so how did you all kind of like map out in kind of understanding what each actor's individual needs were going to be and making sure that you could create that space for them all? Well, you know, it, it, it was, um, you know, every every individual is different. I mean, we had a very lovely cast as far as you know temperament. They all got along lovely, so it was a, it was a very happy set. You know, I wasn't there as much as I wanted to be because we were. You know, it was a hard show to write. Um, I was in L.A. and and they were in Chicago, so I would I went back. I went up a couple times, uh, and and most of it was phone conversations. And and uh, you know, our John and Glenn, our fantastic directors, kind of led the, the show. And Charlie Gogolak, who's a, a, a producer, was there. He was kind of like he was kind of keeping everybody, you know, kind of, uh, you know, he was kind of the the, the guiding voice. Um, but it it, it, it um, you know, each individual, you know, actor had their own questions. I mean, Slattery's was John's was very a complex character, and and there was a lot of talking to be done. And and uh, by the way, a lot of input from John. John was, you know, John. Uh, is very smart 
and very intuitive. And so, you know, he, I would, you know, there'd be a scene where, you know, it would call for him to do X and he would say, you know, wouldn't I really do this? And I think in this moment I would do Y and, and, you know, he was right. And, uh, you know, the only other person I remember working, you know, who, who really was like was Kiefer Sutherland, who was, who was, you know, who had a very kind of real, you know, lock on his character. And when he wanted, when he was suggesting something, 99% of the time, it was, it turned out to be the right choice. And here, I think it was the same thing. John kind of really understood what he, what the character, once he, once he, once I gave him the information and once I kind of told him what I think the character is, and once he read what the character is and was suffering and is and experiencing, he kind of took it under his wing and, and took the character in his wing and, be, and it became his, which is what you want, by the way. And, you know, and the same goes for all of the other actors. I mean, they all kind of did the same thing. Even Evan, by the way, Evan was, uh, Evan is one of the, the smartest uh, uh, kids I've, I've ever met. I mean, it, it's, uh, he was, he was like really into this character and he understood what was going on and, and uh, his performance is astounding. But I mean, it, it's like, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, we just had, we just, we, we had an embarrassment of riches with this cast, frankly. I mean, every single one of them is tremendous, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and they all, every single one of them just kind of like drilled into their characters and just understood and had a lot of questions. And there was a lot of really dialogue. It's just, op you know, keeping an open dialogue and answering questions and being open to suggestions. Yeah. And was that kind of the similar dialogue that you had in terms of the directors of the show who you were just mentioning? Because, you know, you're creating this entire world and you obviously have such a clear idea of, of how you view everything coming together, but then you're ultimately kind of handing the keys over to someone else to, to carry forth the, you know, the actual execution of it all. So what did that collaborative relationship look like between all of you in making sure that it was a really cohesive vision with, between everybody's skill set? Well, you know, it's really a lot of it is just p plain simple communication and understanding i mean the, the, we all we had a bright group of uh, really great directors who you know they're able to see what we had shot before and what it looked like and what the feel of it was so they were able to look at that and, and kind of carry it forward plus uh you know uh, john uh john rico and glenn ficara by the way they created a really beautiful lookbook which was a uh, a kind of a style guide for the series uh with images and also kind of directives about what we do and what we don't do little things which might you know seem silly but you I mean one of the things is that the show doesn't really do establishing shots you know it, it's a small thing but we don't cut to a outside of a house and then cut inside and people are talking we just cut inside um and that's a small thing but it, it, it is a language that establishes that's part of the show where the show just you know kind of ha cuts to the scene we don't linger outside, we don't linger in places, and we don't try to establish something, we just move. Um, uh, so the little things like that, that were kind of built into this style guide that were kind of, you know, the grammar of the show, um, really were, you know, we really kind of hewed closely to it. And uh, it, um, you know, we, we were trying to go for something where it looked like, you know, the, 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 the events in the show were happening and we were just happened to be there to film them not so much we were creating them or designing them on camera. It's more like the, hopefully the crew was kind of hurrying to catch up to film these, these things that are happening. Yeah. So that's kind of the feeling. Yeah, and because you brought up 24, um, which you worked on for several seasons previously, I was interested in kind of like some of the parallels between that show and this show. They're vastly, vastly different shows, but there's an interesting dynamic in the type of suspense and pacing that they're both pulling together. Sure. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit about what some of the tools were that you feel like you really developed and honed in your time working on 24 were that came in to be really valuable resources in working on a show like this. Well. I mean, the, 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 the most valuable research, I, I, the most valuable thing in 24, which we always kind of hammered home to each other is what are the stakes? Mm -hmm. What are we fighting for or against? Mm -hmm. uh, and that has to be very, by the way, great movie, Knives Out. Uh, it has to be, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I like that bug, that movie was fantastic. I'm a little talk show mug. <laughs> um, I didn't guess who the killer was, by the way. I mean, my son did, but I have no idea who it was. Anyway, um, so we, I'm sorry, what was I talking about? Oh, the, uh, the, um, the parallels of like 24 and the tools. Oh, 24, right. Well, you know, it really was the stakes. I mean, we, we decided, um, you know, what the, uh, it, on 24, we were just kind of like, it was always, we were feverishly kind of, what's the, what's the stakes? What's going to happen if we fail? 
and that's it sounds simple but very often you kind of will find if you don't really careful you can you can that can get lost and you can realize hey there's nothing really at stake here that's why this isn't happening that's why nobody's you know you know excited uh and why the story's kind of limp um and uh and also what do our this very strictly what do they what do these people want and what are they trying to achieve in every given moment you know I just I didn't want these scenes where people just kind of get together and discuss their past because it's time for a character break. I wanted it to be, you know, kind of a, a you know, everything was kind of under this pressure cooker situation moment. And that's 24, you know, by, you know, really couldn't be called a character piece, but it but it had a lot of character moments, but all of them were fueled by the in the pressure situation that they were under, which I think is what made them so interesting and why that show was so addictive. Um, and so I, I really kind of try to use that uh, here as well to keep the show, you know, um, engaging in the sense that, you know, it was, it was all, everything was unfolding for a reason and towards a very kind of specific and frightening, uh, uh, there's a specific goal and a frightening, you know, uh, uh, event that's going to happen if we fail. Um, and so, you know, beyond that, it's really, it's really, you know, plotting it out so that, you know, there's, there are steps along the way that we, you know, we're basically 24 really was an example of a show that every, know, every, every episode was kind of every episode we fail. It was like one failure after another until you get to the victory. And, and a lot of that followed this as well. It's like, you know, there's a lot of bumps along the way and everything's going to go get worse and worse and worse until hopefully we figure it out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking time to watch, to I talk so much about the show today. And I hope that everyone watching this Q and A will dive straight into next on Fox. And thank you so much, Manny. Thank you.